be here with you. As Ben mentioned, I literally was in your chair uh, almost 10 years ago, so it's, it's been a little while. We were actually in the, in the BSM building in those days on Tuesday nights, but uh, really is a joy uh, to, be, uh, to be with you. Uh, this place is has changed my life in so many different ways. Uh, this university, uh, this ministry has impacted me literally in countless ways. Uh, my wife and I um, grew closer uh, through the ministry of BSM. We spent a lot of time together uh, at different BSM functions and whatnot. Um, certainly have met some lifelong friends through this ministry. Many of them are staff members now when we were students together, and so I'm thankful for uh, UTA for that reason. I still have deep friendships because of this place. Um, uh, ben had mentioned that I, that I played baseball here for a couple years, met some dear friends there. Some of those guys are still playing uh, professionally, so it's fun to keep up with them. But there was one way that UTA impacted me that I did not anticipate, and that was the course of study that I actually went through when I was a student. So I, I was an English major uh, here at UTA. Any English majors? Or, okay, a few. Yeah, yeah, so very cool. Uh, so my dad's a sports writer, still is to this day, sports writer, sports editor for uh, a massive sports magazine. And so I kind of grew up in that world and uh, wanted to explore that. Felt called to ministry, knew I was going to go to seminary, so thought that I needed to learn how to read and write. And so English was a, a great course of study for me. But it actually wasn't my English degree uh, that changed my life. It was actually my minor here at UTA, which was history. Any history minors or majors? All right, a few of us. Very good. So I was a history minor here, which really set me on a trajectory of loving to read history, loving to read biography. And that's what my PhD uh, that I just wrapped up was in, was in church history. And so I, I enjoy reading a biography. But one thing that I tried to do was to branch out of that world as far as church history. Right? I, I, I read a lot of that because I have to. I wanted to read some things that I wanted to to read, so different biographies, and so earlier this year, I decided that I would tackle a book that I had been wanting to read for a while, and it's the autobiography of a guy named Theodore Roosevelt. Many of you probably have heard of Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, just a massive figure. I mean, just an incredible, incredible guy, phenomenal leader. He's on all of the lists. When you want to Google the best presidents in, in the history of the country, Teddy Roosevelt is up there. He wrote a book that changed uh, naval history studies which is a, kind of a niche area, but he wrote a book that changed that field in his 20s, which makes me feel, you know, incredibly unaccomplished compared to him. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, is on Mount Rushmore, uh, so he's a, a, a massive figure literally on Mount, on Mount Rushmore. Um, he ended up in a Ben Stiller movie, Night at the Museum. Anybody remember Night at the Museum? Yeah, so not only is he on Mount Rushmore... But he's in a Ben Stiller movie, and he's played by Robin Williams. Like that, that is legendary status, uh, if, if I've ever heard of it. And so as I, as I was thinking about the book that I wanted to read, I, I came across this autobiography of Teddy Roosevelt. And I thought, you know, I'm so unlike him. Right? I mean, he's this brilliant leader. He is this famed figure. He's this outdoorsman. I'm, I'm very indoorsy, okay? He, he liked to go out and hunt and ride horses and all of these different things. He was born about 100 years before I was. So I, when I encountered this autobiography, I thought, am I going to relate to him at all? And, and, of course, in many ways, I did not because I didn't have the same experiences that he had. But there was one thing that I read in that autobiography that I resonated with so, so deeply. One thing that, that I want to mention about Teddy Roosevelt is if you just say that to somebody on the street, that name, they may not remember all the different things that he did, but, but they may be able to conjure up a face to put with that name. And typically, they're going to think of that face with a set of glasses on that face. You can see here, even in the movie. T Teddy Roosevelt was, was famous for having these, these spectacles, as he called them, these lenses. And so you can just Google a picture of this guy, and he's going to be wearing those glasses. That kind of became his claim to fame, in a sense. When you thought of Teddy Roosevelt, you thought about these glasses. Now, I'm a glasses wearer and a contacts wearer as well. So he said something in that autobiography that just stuck out to me. And let me read you what he said. 
He was talking about the situation where he began to realize he couldn't see uh, some advertisements from far away. He was out with his buddies shooting guns, and he was missing, and they were all hitting the target. And so he was beginning to realize he couldn't see very well, and this is what he, what he said. He said, I could not see, and yet I was wholly ignorant that I was not seeing. I could not see, and yet I was wholly ignorant that I was not seeing. Now, if you wear glasses or contacts here this evening, you may remember that moment when those lenses first went on your eyes. It was like a whole new world opened to you, right? You saw colors that you had never seen, and you saw images and sharpness and clarity that you had never seen up until that moment, but you didn't know what you didn't know, right? We didn't know that we weren't seeing clearly until the lenses were put on our eyes. Listen, as a, as a lens wearer myself, if I'm not wearing my contacts or my glasses, I can literally be a danger to myself and to other people. That's why on my driver's license, there's a little marker that says this guy cannot be operating a motor vehicle unless he's wearing corrective lenses. So I, but legally, like I have to wear these because if I, if I cannot see clearly, then I'm a danger to myself, I'm a danger to other people. Here's what I want to talk about tonight. Spiritually, if you and I are not seeing clearly, then we can be a danger to ourselves and we can be a danger to others. If we're not seeing clearly, interpreting the world around us, interpreting ourselves in this place uh, that we live, this world, if we're not seeing those things through the right lenses, we can be in a very dangerous place. And, and let me say this, friends. It, it's entirely possible to think that you're seeing clearly and yet not be seeing clearly at all. It's entirely possible for you and me to think that we can see reality clearly and yet not see it clearly at all. That's exactly what happened to Teddy Roosevelt as a young boy. He thought he was seeing, but he wasn't. And that can happen to us too. We think we're seeing clearly the world around us, ourselves, God himself, and yet we're not seeing clearly at all. So the question that, that I have for you tonight is, through what lenses are you interpreting the world around you? Now, it's not a question of if you are looking through lenses to make sense of this place, to make sense of yourself, to make sense of God. That, that's not a question. We all do that. We all are looking through some type of lenses, not physical lenses, of course, but, but some grid through which we understand ourselves and the world around us. So we all do that. The question is, what lenses are you looking out of? Are they helping you see reality clearly or are they causing you to see reality and even God himself with fuzziness? So the goal tonight is to help you see the Savior through the lenses of Scripture. That's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the importance of the Bible as the lens that th through which we look to see Jesus we're going to look at the Savior through the lenses of Scripture. What I want us to do tonight is, just for a moment, is, is to fix our eyes on Christ by fixing our eyes on the Word. I know this semester you've been talking about that concept of looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Christ, and we want to do that. And one of the most important ways that we do that is, to buy, is by fixing our hearts and our minds on the Scriptures. Listen, if we begin to fail to treasure the Bible and treasure the Scriptures that God has given us, then eventually we will begin to fail to treasure Jesus Christ. And so I invite you in your Bibles to turn to Psalm chapter 119. It's a very long chapter in the Bible. We are not going to walk through the entire chapter. Find verse 9, Psalm 119 verse 9. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 16. Uh, just for the sake of time, we're not going to look at every single verse here. Uh, we're just going to look at a few of these. My note takers in the room tonight may be a little bit frustrated because there's not like a logical order that we're going to follow. Instead, these verses just kind of give us these rapid fire reflections that we're going to look at and talk about. Again, remember our driving aim tonight is to look at the Savior through the lenses of Scripture. And so we're going to talk about why the Bible is so important to your Christian life and my Christian life if you're a believer, if you're 
you're not a believer, I hope that at the end of this message, you just, you, you have a better understanding of why we take the Bible so seriously as believers. We certainly don't worship the Bible. We worship God alone, but God has given us the Bible uh, to tell us his story so that we can get to know him better. That's why we take this book so seriously. Now, in these verses, we're going to encounter a number of words, words like commandment or law or statute or word. All of these are synonyms that are referring us back to God's revealed word in the scriptures. And so I'm going to dive right in. Again, we're going to talk about the importance of the Bible. Remember that driving theme? We want to talk about the importance of scripture as our lens to see Jesus more clearly. So Psalm 119, starting in verse 9. This is what scripture says. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I love that, that this is the first question that we're confronted with at this part of the psalm. How can a young man keep his way pure? Listen, I recognize that I'm in a, in a room of 18 to, to 20 somethings and you guys are asking really important questions of, of life. I'm not that far beyond you. I, I'm 30 and so I'm asking some of the same questions still that you are, but you're asking very important questions. Questions like, what am I gonna end up majoring in? What, what am I gonna do at the end of these next two, three, four, five years, whatever it is? What's my job gonna be? Right, who, who am I gonna spend my life with? What, what, what am I gonna do with the, the remaining years that the Lord gives me? Hey, listen, these are, these are very good questions. And this is a great place, the BSM, to be asking some of those questions and working through those with other people. But my fear is that far too often, those questions are the first questions that we ask about life. But notice, that's not the first question that this writer is, is asking. He, he asks, how can I make my way pure? How can I cleanse my way? Too many of us ask first, how can I make my way in this world? Not how can I cleanse my way? How can I make my way in this job or with this relationship or whatever it may be? And that's a good question, but it's not the most important question. The most important question we see here in Psalm 119 is how can I cleanse my way? Holiness, friends, should be our first pursuit as believers in Jesus Christ. Not to say those other things are not important, but if you and I are asking, how can I make my way first, then we're already asking the wrong question. The question is, how can we cleanse our way? How can we live lives of holiness and purity according to God's word? Listen, for you as a college student, the goal is not ultimately to be something. The goal for you is to be like someone, Jesus Christ himself. So let me ask you this, what's the lens that you are looking through as you're thinking about those questions? What's the lens that you're looking through on the path that you are walking? Is that lens the world, the world telling you, here's how you should live your life, here's how you should talk and think and believe, or is it the word? Which lens are you interpreting your future through? I pray that that it's the word of God. Because notice, look back in verse nine, if, if this young man wants to keep his way pure and clean and holy, look at what it says. It says he's gonna guard his life according to God's word. If we don't know God's word and we're not intaking God's word, uh, then we're gonna be in trouble if we wanna live, live lives of, of purity and holiness. So that's the first question I have for you. What, what question are you asking? Are you asking how can I make my way in this world first or are you asking how can I cleanse my way? If we wanna live lives of holiness, we've got to, to ask that question through the lens of God's word. Look at the next verse with me, verse 10, Psalm 119, verse 10. The Bible says this, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. My whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Notice the connection there in that verse between communion with God and the commandments of God. So this intimacy with God, we can't have that if this book is staying closed on our bookshelf. Right? If we want to stay close to the Lord, then we need to stay close to his word. That's what this verse is, is, is trying to help us understand. And I love this about the writer here. This writer, he is not impressed with 
a vague spirituality, a vague searching for God, an empty calorie faith. He's not impressed with that. Notice he's saying, I'm going to seek the Lord God with all of my heart. I'm going to love the Lord God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's not after just sort of this amorphous kind of belief or spirituality. He wants to know the true God through the word. One of my favorite writers, pastors, authors is a guy named Ray Ortland. Uh, Ray is kind of like a, a, a Yoda, a pastoral Yoda for, for a lot of us younger guys. I mean, he's just brilliant um, and, and he's so sharp and insightful. And I read something in a book uh, that he wrote that has never left me. And this is what he said. I think this applies especially perhaps to, to college students. He said this, we live in a day where it's cool to search for God, but it's uncool to find him. We live in a day where it's cool to search for God, but it's uncool to find him. But we live in a day where almost anybody's saying, I'm, I'm attracted to spirituality and, and uh, I'm on this spiritual journey. And, and hey, that, that's, that's great. That's where we all start. Uh, but, but so many people, they kind of balk at Jesus when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And, and, and so what this writer is saying is he's saying, I'm not after just some vague search. I want to know God. I want to know the God who is. I want to know the living God who's revealed himself. Well, the way that we do that, again, is through the lenses of of scripture. Look back at verse 10. He says, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander away from your commandments. If we're wandering from the word, then we're not going to be able to walk with the Lord. Let me not wander. I, I love that, that, that the writer says that there, because I feel that sometimes. I mean, that's literally in a hymn that, that if you grew up in church, you, you sang those words, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Well, that's what this psalm's getting at. We all have this tendency to wander away from God, to pursue our own desires. And yet he's praying, God, I don't want to wander from you. And not just wander from you in a general sense. I don't want to wander from your word. Anchor me in this scripture. He has this good understanding of himself. He, he understands his tendency to drift. He understands his tendency to wander. I have that in my own heart. I think if we're all honest, we would say that, that yeah, I, I sense that in myself. I feel that. But what's the solution? I think one of the solutions is found in the next verse. If wandering has been a plague for every generation, how, how can we be sure that we don't fall victim or fall into that, that trap. Well, Psalm 119, 11 helps us. This is what scripture says. It says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've stored up your word. The book of Colossians says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. I've taken in God's word. I've treasured it. I've hidden it in my heart for the reason of not sinning against God. One of my favorite writers and pastors, uh, he said something to the effect of, of you have to remember that the Bible is for formation, not just information. The Bible is for formation, not just information. If I want to be formed into the image of Christ, then I need his word. And if I want to be formed into knowing God and being the, the man of God that God wants to be, then I can't do that apart from scripture. And so I want to treasure God's word in my heart so that I can be formed, so that I might not sin against God, so that I might follow the will of God. That's what verse 11 is trying to, trying to help us understand. So your translation may say there in verse 11, I've hidden your word in your heart. It may say, I have stored up your word uh, in my heart. The best way to render that phrase uh, in, the, in the original language is, is the phrase treasure. I've treasured your word in my heart. Listen, there's a real connection here between treasuring God's word and following God's will. Treasuring God's will and not sinning against him. I wonder if you could just kind of self-reflect for a moment. Uh, for, for those of you who, who are believers, like, is that, is that a part of your Christian discipleship? Treasuring God's word, taking it in, hiding it in your heart? It's so important as we walk with Jesus Christ to, to do that. 
Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite books is a, a book called The Silver Chair. Uh, the Silver Chair was written by a guy you may have heard of named C.S. Lewis. And uh, it's in the Chronicles of Narnia. The Silver Chair does not get the press, right? Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe gets all the press. Uh, but The Silver Chair is, is really this fascinating book, and it's one of my favorites. And, and in The Silver Chair, uh, you meet a young girl named Jill. And Jill is uh, in our world at the beginning of the book, but she really gets yanked into Narnia. And she's not quite sure what's going on. And she's, she's on this kind of cliff, this, this massive cliff. She can see the clouds below her. And there in front of her, if that's not scary enough, she sees this massive lion. If you're familiar with this story, you know that this lion is Aslan. And Aslan is this embodiment uh, of Jesus Christ, this Christ figure, if you will, throughout the entire series. And so Jill faces this lion named Aslan, and she doesn't know where she's at. She doesn't know what she's gotten herself into. And Aslan tells Jill that he's got a mission for her. He's brought her into Narnia for a particular job, a mission that he's going to send her out to do. There's a prince that has been captured, and he's being held hostage, and he's literally under underneath the ground, and Aslan has called Jill to go rescue him. Now, here's the thing that Aslan tells Jill. He says, listen, up here, the air is clean. The air is crisp. You can think logically and clearly, but when you get down into the real world, things are going to get really fuzzy for you. And so, what Aslan does is he gives Jill a set of statements. The book calls them signs, proverbs, if you will. These statements that Jill is supposed to recite out loud to hide in her heart so that she can remember what Aslan told her up in Aslan's country because she's going to forget down in the real world because life is difficult and people are going to be against her. So Aslan gives her these statements that she's supposed to depend on for guidance. She's commanded to repeat them, and as the story goes... You may have guessed that she begins to forget to repeat these proverbs, these signs, these statements. When she gets down into the real world, things begin to get fuzzy. And, and Lewis says this, And Jill gave up her habit of repeating the signs over to herself every night and morning. She said to herself at first that she was tired, but she soon forgot all about it. Like, I get that, right? If I want to hide the word of God in my heart, just as Aslan told Jill to hide these statements in her heart, I, I know what it feels like to say, I, I was really tired, I'm pretty busy. And yet the world that the Lord has sent us into can be challenging and difficult, and we need God's word to give us clarity. We need to look through those lenses so that we can understand what God has called us to do. The lenses of this world are foggy and unclear, so we need to hide God's word in our heart. Of course, this caused problems for Jill's mission. And we'll revisit that here in a moment. Look back in verse 15 in Psalm 119. Skip down. We're going we're gonna to skip a few verses. Verse 15 says this, I will meditate on your precepts. And I will fix my eyes on your ways. This is where that language of fixing our eyes on Jesus by fixing our eyes on Scripture, seeing Jesus through the lenses of Scripture, really kind of jumps off the page here. He says that he's going to meditate on, on God's word, God's precepts. And he's going to fix his eyes on God's ways. Of course, again, the way that we do that is by looking at the Bible. Look in verse 18, just a few verses down, we're going to see the same theme. It says this, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Listen, we need God to open our eyes to the truth of his word. We need God to help us understand the beauty and the majesty of the scriptures. And so I just would encourage you to pray that prayer daily to ask God to open your eyes, to put the right lenses on your eyes so that you can see him clearly. Listen, we all bring these lenses uh, to, to, to our lives, whether they're, they're lenses based off of our past experiences that we've had, lenses based off fear, lenses based off whatever it may be. And again, those can cause us to see God in ourselves uh, 
with, with, with fogginess. And so we need the Lord to open up our eyes to, to him. And, and the way that we do that, notice in that verse is by meditating on scripture. This isn't a meditation where we're just emptying our minds. Rather, it's a meditation where we're filling our minds with the word of God. So let me just ask you this question. What, what might that look like for you individually? To, to take verse 15 and to apply it directly to your life, right? A- ask yourself, how, how, what may it look like for me to meditate on God's word and for me to fix my eyes on God's ways? That, that may look like a recommitment just to, to reading the scripture at a, at a routine pace. I wonder what that might look like for, for some of you in a group setting, whether that's a group here at BSM or, or wherever you live on or off campus, is there a group setting where you can take this verse and apply it to your life? Getting together with some brothers and sisters in the Lord and saying, hey, let's walk through this book together and let's talk about what we're seeing. Maybe you have a friend who, who doesn't know Jesus Christ yet. What might this look like for you to go to that friend and say, hey, if you're willing, I would just love to read through the gospel of Mark with you. And just get your feedback and, and tell me what you're, what you're seeing. Is that something you'd be interested in? There are any number of ways that we can fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. I would just encourage you, before you go to bed tonight, figure out one way that that applies to you individually and perhaps even in a group setting here at the BSM or at the church. But I love the diligence that we see in verse 15. He says, I will do this. I will meditate on God's precepts. I will fix my eyes on God's ways. And finally, that leads us to the, the final verse of this little section, verses 9 through 16. And verse 16 says this, I will delight in your statutes, your word, the Bible, and I will not forget your word. I will not forget your word. Notice what the, notice what the writer says about the scriptures here. This is so important. If we want to have a healthy understanding of the Bible, he he says that he's going to delight in the word of God. He's not just going to begrudgingly submit to it out of mere obligation, but he's going to enjoy it and delight in it and return to it like an oasis in a desert. Uh, Too many people, I think, and I've been guilty of this in my own life, we, we can think about the Bible as sort of just like this appendix to our Christian life. It's there, it's available if we need it, But if we don't, then we're okay on our own to keep moving in this direction. But that's not the concept that the writer here has. He says, I'm going to delight in this. Some people see it as even worse than an appendix. They'll they'll see it as this oppressive or dated or ancient book that, that, that has nothing to say to us today. And again, that's just a foreign concept to the Bible itself. And that's a foreign concept to Christians over the centuries who have walked with Jesus by reading the word. We don't delight in something, friends, that's oppressive or that suffocates us. We delight in things that free us, that refresh us, that, that strengthen and empower us. And friends, let me, let me just say, that's, that's what this book is. Uh, th- this book will strengthen and encourage you if you delight in it. And as you read it, you will grow to delight in it. Let me just encourage you, view the Bible correctly, not as an oppressive or outdated book, but as the very word of God, his message to you and to his church and to the world about what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the the very last verse says, I will not forget your word. I, I shall not forget your word. Some translations say, of course, this is a fitting conclusion, right? We would, after everything that he said, we're not surprised that he says, okay, the Bible's super important. I'm not gonna forget what it says. And so then that section of the Psalm is over. But remember, the entirety of Psalm 119 is not over at verse 16 got 170 some odd verses in this psalm. And so though that section is over, the psalm itself is not over. Now it's going to continue to go on and say verses and proverbs and and, and psalms to, to, to that effect. Everything we've just talked about is essentially what Psalm 119 is repeating. But actually, Psalm 119 ends in a really strange way. It actually ends in a really interesting 
way. To turn in your Bibles to, to verse 176, you probably have to turn a few pages. Uh, there, there, there's a, a lot to Psalm 119, but the way that it ends has always struck me as really interesting, kind of, kind of fascinating. This, this is what it says in 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. It's the final song, that's the final verse of Psalm 119, which he ends that the same way he did verse 16, right? I will not forget your commandments. I will not forget your word. But notice what it says right before that in Psalm 119, verse 176. He says, the writer says at the very end of this thing, he says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. This is really a stunning kind of example of transparency here. I mean, the guy has spent 175 verses talking about the importance of following God's word, right? But then in the very last verse, he says, I actually have gone astray like a lost sheep. In other words, I haven't followed God's word perfectly. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. He hasn't lived up to honoring God in every way. He hasn't treasured God's word in his heart perfectly. So again, this is a stunning act of humility and transparency. And what we see here is a person who understands that they don't live up to this psalm. They have not embodied this psalm perfectly. This is a person who has turned from God in some way. They've not honored God in their lives. And listen, friends, this this is an indictment that includes all of us. The Bible is just clear. This is a biblical theme. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. The writer of Psalm 119 went astray like a lost sheep. And Isaiah 56 says, we've all followed suit. We've all gone astray. As lost and wandering sheep. And listen, the result of our going astray is not simply that we're lost in this life. But the ultimate result is that we're lost for eternity. We're separated from God because of our sin and our rebellion against him. Listen, God demands perfect adherence to Psalm 119 and to the rest of the scriptures in order for us to be in the presence of a holy God. And we've all miserably failed at that. We're all in on this together. This is the biblical concept of sin and it separates us from the God who created us. You and I are guilty of this sin and we're, we're separated from God. We've all rejected God in one way or another. Jill's friend uh, in the, the, the silver chair, she meets a character named Puddle Glum. Puddle Glum is one of the best characters in all of the Chronicles of Narnia. And he makes a statement about the results of her failing to, to, to repeat these commands. He says this, we've brought the anger of Aslan on us. That's what comes from not attending to the signs. We are under a curse. And friends, it's true of us as well. None of us in this room have perfectly attended to God's word. And because of that, the Bible tells us that we are under a curse, separated from God in this life. And if we don't trust in Christ, separated from him for eternity. But listen, there is good news in the Bible. The Bible tells us this story about God's rescue mission to you and to me and to the world. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life, to be the embodiment of Psalm 119 and all of the scriptures as he perfectly loved loved his neighbor and he perfectly loved his father and Jesus came and on that cross he died in our place taking the punishment and the wrath upon himself absorbing God's wrath that God rightly had for you and for me Jesus took it in our place on the cross he credited us with his perfect righteousness on the cross he died and three days later, he came back from the dead. This is the good news of the Bible, that Jesus Christ is alive, and now he offers all people who will repent of their sin and trust in him forgiveness and new life, now and for eternity. This is the story of the Bible, friends, that if you're not a believer tonight, you can be set free from that curse. Romans 8.1 says that for those who are in Christ, there is no longer any condemnation. There's no more curse. There's freedom and forgiveness and hope. And so Teddy Roosevelt, in that autobiography, he said something that I thought was uh, interesting. When he was talking about getting those glasses for the first time, he said this. Uh, when he realized he couldn't see, when he realized that he was in danger, 
He said, I spoke of this to my father. And soon afterwards, I got my first pair of spectacles, which literally opened an entirely new world to me. I had no idea how beautiful the world was until I got those spectacles. Listen, friends, if we want to see the beauty, not only of the world, but if we want to see the beauty of the triune God in all of his majesty, then we look through the lenses of scripture. If you're here tonight and you're not a believer in in Christ, you can speak of this to the Father. You can tell him that, Lord, I need you to save me through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he will. You repent of your sin and, and trust in him. If you are a believer tonight, let me just encourage you to take and put on these lenses, to hide it in your heart, to soak it up in your mind, to meditate on it, to saturate your life in this word because the God of the Bible is more beautiful than we could ever imagine. We can get a glimpse of him through the scripture and if you put your faith in Christ, you're gonna behold that with your own eyes one day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've given us your word, that you have not left us as orphans to figure out our own way in this fallen, broken, fractured world. You've revealed yourself and your grace and your scriptures ultimately tell the story of what you've done to rescue us. Lord, I pray for that. For, for those that are in this room who are, who, who are following Christ, Lord, would you implant in their heart a deeper desire to meditate upon your word, to fix their eyes on you by fixing their eyes on the scriptures, to hide and treasure your word in their heart. God, give them that hunger, just a relentless hunger to know and read and meditate and soak up the scriptures, God. And Lord, if there's anybody in this room tonight, Lord, who doesn't know you personally, I pray that they would recognize that they can be set free from that curse this evening through the blood of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, God. And I pray that they would put their faith in you so that they can be saved and they can behold you as well. Lord, bless us as we go from this place into our small groups and as we worship in this final song. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.